used to see Bill hanging around Probe, the old Probe. Yeah. With his guitar in his bag and wearing his car coat. And his hair was probably just getting over his ears back then. And uh, I was in a, in a punk band and the drummer was really bitchy and he'd always be like bitching about Bill. Oh, Bill looked like, you know, typical heavy metal guy, longer. And um, I finally only got speaking to him when I joined what became Carcass. I remember playing a gig in my old band, Electric Peace, and Ken and Bill were there. What's really funny and what really sums up their personalities yeah, perfectly. Or no, it was up at the university. Excellent. Like, I mean, Bill had a, a denim jacket on with two patches sewn perfectly on the back. One was Slayer, one was uh, Venom Black Metal. Now, Ken had a cut off denim jacket with every conceivable extreme thrash band scribbled on it in Marker Pen and Byron, from Exodus to NYC Mayhem to, you know, Discharge. And this sums up their personalities perfectly. Ken just had this mess of bands scribbled in Marker Pen. And Bill had this perfectly kind of controlled seven <laughs> patches. <laughs> you know, I think that kind of summed them up. So, and I didn't. I wasn't speaking to them at the time because you know I was in a band. I didn't speak to uh, the audience. You know. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I mean, I joined the band with Bill, and then we, I think we were discussing getting another drummer. And he said, "Oh, I've got a friend who's just brought a drum kit." And that was Ken. And we were like, "Let's try jamming with him." So. That's when I first met Ken. Ken probably turned up in his school uniform, I mean. And did that. Only because I, I asked him, it was a sexual thing, you know? We gelled through it almost instantly. Uh, that, that, that was really useful because we didn't really spend a lot of time trying to write stuff. It just came naturally in terms of uh, the, the, the style that we chose to write in was um, based on what me and Bill used to listen to, death metal and heavy metal, and we had to, we had, we had to try and formulate our own style. So we uh, we took took the elements that we li like to listen to and added on to them. When I when I first seen up with Bill, he had this logo. I'll have to send you a copy of it so you can put it on the film. It looks like the Marillion logo. So even before we'd even rehearsed, thank you. That was me farting. But even before we rehearsed, I'd redrawn the logo because I just—I was not going to be in a band with a logo that looked like Marillion. So, I mean, I wanted to change the name, but the other two were having none of it. I wanted to call it Jeff Walker. <laughs> <laughs> the Jeff Walker experience. Yeah. <laughs> Most people call Carcass a death metal band. Is that? Do you think a fair term? <laughs> Do you no. yourself death We would have done when we were 15, but um, yeah. and we, th you know, definitely our first album we thought we, thought we were, but uh, you know, time moves on. And I think death metal now, especially the bands that are around that are calling themselves death metal, and I call that, you know, whatever. Um, if they're death metal, then we're not. Simple as that. When you got cocked up and running, you were um, you were rehearsing at your parents' house. Yeah? Correct. How were they about that? Brilliant. Um, I mean, my parents, they were just so neutral about the whole thing. I mean, they never really actively encouraged me, but they never discouraged me. They just let me do my thing, really. And um, that's the way I remember it. Uh, I always remember your mother wasn't too happy when any of us took uh, dog shit. <laughs> she lived in a very, in a, a very dark road. And in the winter, you couldn't see the dog turn, so. <laughs> Excuse me, Bill, there's leaves on the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fine. I mean, we had a few problems with the neighbours. Um, the bloke next door wasn't too happy. Um, but it was interesting because my dad doesn't like to offend anybody. I mean, he, he, you know, he's not that kind of person. He's very non-confrontational. And so the guy would come around from next door and complain about the noise. And my dad would just listen to him and kind of nod his head. And then he'd, he'd just close the door and not say a word to me. <laughs> so, I don't know, it worked out quite well. Who was, the, who was in the original lineup? It depends what you're talking about. I mean, when Ken and Bill were, you know, kids playing with each other, I mean, we won't go into that. I mean, we've had counselling for that since. Um, it was them and a couple of friends, wasn't it? Chris Gardner and some of the Yeah. Lot. Dave Potter says. No idea who these people no. are. He's making these names up, I think. Mm. And what, what about um, Sanjiv? I told you never ever to mention that. That's really professional. Sorry. <laughs> that, You're that you, Michael? That's it. That's it. All about this 
infatuation is with Sanji. I, it's, a, it's an open thing. It, 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 it actually says, where is the mythical Sanji? Why is he mythical? I don't know. I, I heard he was just a bit shit, so you <laughs> didn't go with it. But. No, I mean, what happened is, uh, like the guy Peck, he was singing, he'd, he'd been in the band Dis Attack and was still hanging out with us. I mean, he never really, uh, you know, started rehearsing with us or singing. And he, kind of, he was leaving, so we, these guys figured we needed a vocalist and Sanjeev, through Peck, got the gig. Um, we rehearsed a bit with him, we did one recording, a demo with him. But he was a bit older and he, he I don't know, he just didn't seem like he was fitting in. I mean, uh, I don't know, maybe Bill should be able to talk to this and Ken, but he just kind of drifted away, yeah, you know? Yeah, basically that's what it was, wasn't it? Yeah, he just didn't really show much interest. Yeah, I mean, we did a recording and we played our first gigs with him. You did record stuff with him? Yeah, we did a demo. But he's, 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 he's a strange, he's a yeah. very strange character. He's probably like five years older, which isn't, when you get to our age now, five years is nothing. But when you're 17 or 18, that's like half your life or something. Mm. And this guy used to get out of bed and draw things in Byro on his own, like Slayer or Deep Wind. And it was kind of strange. We got worried. <laughs> when I'd like to impress you now and tell you what his surname was, we were really kind of bloody no, I have no idea. We know, you know, we were so uh, rude back then, we never asked people's surnames. Nothing changes, eh? No. <laughs> you just point the camera, shut the fuck up, <laughs> Phil. I mean, what happened is, they, they'd taken on the name Carcass, I got asked to join on bass, and through people losing interest, or this, that, and the other, um, we invited Ken to come and start playing with us, and that's where Carcass, in its professional form, by professional I mean, you know, we had some new guitar strings, that's with you know, that came into the equation, that was probably 87 I think. Yeah. If could bullshit and say it was 86, I'm pretty sure it was 87. Are you a Liverpool band? No. No. So what? I mean, he was born in Billings, which is towards Wigan. I was born in St. Allen's, and Bill was born in South Shields or something like that. Something like that, yeah. yeah somewhere, some, up oh, something up north. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's because like, Liverpool's the, the most central metropolis that we grew up near, so that's why people think we are. We recorded two albums, one in Kirby and one in Liverpool. Was it Amazon? No, it's, yeah, Amazon, which is like Kirby, uh, Sandswood, Kirby Way. Did one in Par Street, one was done in Rockfield in Wales, and one was done in, One was done in, well, it was a mixing batch, wasn't it? Yeah. Sometime. One was done in uh, Driffield, Yorkshire, and the other one was done in Rich Pitch in Birmingham, which I'm sure you're quite familiar with that film. Spent a day with Mick Harris there. Absolutely. Okay. Um... I feel traumatised by that whole thing. <laughs> The, the, the twitch is barely noticeable. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is another one where there'll be a different version from each person you speak to. The way I remember it is that um, sometime around when I was leaving school, um, Ken was writing lyrics just for fun, wasn't he? Yeah. And uh, he came up with some pretty bizarre stuff. And um, I think some of those lyrics that you just came up, I don't even know why you wrote them, but you just came up with them. Some of those ended up being on the first Carcass album, as far as I remember it. <laughs> Uh, all three of us wrote the lyrics, the first album. Mm. Probably split three ways equally. Was, yeah. Just about at least, yeah. I think it's a real shame that <coughs> you rape and we scrape and never made the final cut. Do you remember that? Yeah, sure. Someone had sprayed on the side of the horse from the abortion clinic on the road. <coughs> I rape and we scrape and okay. We came on to call a song then. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Most of the graphics were down to you, weren't they? The album covers and stuff. Yeah, initially. Mm. Yeah. Uh, plus, you know, the photographers who actually took the photographs and before I cut them out with the medical books, yeah. We were in some library somewhere and we were looking at all kinds of weird stuff and we were going, no, well, you two originally went in, like, guerrilla clandestine, you know, cut out a photograph and you all, remember there was, like, the baby with pus coming out as well? Yeah, so, like, yeah, sure. did, we, did we actually do that? Yeah, yeah. you know. Jeez, sorry. Get the librarians of the world. I didn't realise, I actually, in my mind, it was you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right? So how, um, how did you come up with ideas for graphics and logos and stuff was the, the kind of the gore elements of it was that something that you were interested in or did did that just come through the lyrics that were already being written probably th probably came through the lyrics that had been written um i was more from the kind of for want of a better word and it's embarrassing to admit it the more kind of political hardcore kind of thing i was a crass old you know they're the kind of bands i grew up with so when the, these guys were pretty nihilistic you know they're more kind of have that heavy metal mentality where they didn't give a toss what we were singing about, but they were more interested in um, bands like Repulsion and Death, whose lyrics yeah. were more fantasy based. So, at first I was kind of, oh god, this is kind of you know, cliche, heavy metal crap. But when I saw the lyrics, it was obvious that I realised how funny it was and how stupid and how ludicrous and how extreme we could take it. So, I really got into it. So, um, I, I, I was sold on it. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the graphics and all that were just. Um, it was anything you could do rather than having a fantasy painting painted by, you know, the guy who does the IMA in Alm Sleeves. You know I, mean? I mean, that kind of stuff to me was just too kind of Dungeons and Dragons and kind of that. Like, it's never been my kind of thing. So I guess I was more influenced by that kind of um, John Hartfell, G. Voucher political shit. So doing collages with real photographs. And because we were a death metal band, it was easier to get medical photographs and do collages out of that. So. Earache got raided, didn't they, by the police? Um, and a, a bunch of stuff was confiscated. Do you know much about that? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the, what happened is that jazz guy John Zorn had done an album called Guts of a Virgin, I think it was, and he was using Japanese artwork. And it's pretty, uh, you, know, you know the Japs can get a bit crazy with the idea of what's funny. And I think the picture was you know, a girl with her guts open and maybe the feet was removed. Anyway, that got intercepted at Heathrow, I think, by the customs. So they tipped off the vice squad who raided the Eric office, who decided to com com uh, confiscate carcass albums and all the John Zorn catalogue and some other stuff, including, quite controversially, a Alice Cooper poster, who said Dean was offensive. Um, it, you know, it got dropped. I think. Only the John Zorn thing got seized in the end, so... I mean, basically what happened is, we were clever enough that all the early carcass stuff, although it might have been shocking or controversial to some people, it was done in such a way that we knew what we thought, because we were being smart ass, is that if we ever got busted by the cops, be it copyright or obscenity, we knew we had nothing to stick anyway, so... Um, that is a good question. We'd done a demo, um, the legendary, yeah, with uh, the legendary Sanjeev. And um, <laughs> does anyone come up with a surname from him? <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I think Peck knows him. Tell me, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were writing, rehearsing. We did a demo tape that cost like twenty quid on a four-track machine. Um, Dig was releasing bands like Napalm Death and Unseen Terror. And all these bands are our friends. And I think Mitch, or possibly Shane from Napalm, uh, from Unseen Terror, would give Dig the demo tape. Dig was vaguely in interested, but it's only when he saw the lyric sheet that he really kind of thought, wow, this is cool. Because Dig was really into horror films, like these crappy, you know, gore films like Street Trash and all that kind of stuff. So it really kind of, you know, 
floated his boat. Anyway, but um, yeah, so we did that, and then, uh, you know, at some point, yeah, when I did this scum thing with Napalm. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Um, I remember actually being in the control room with Dig, listening back to a track or something, and he was asking me about my other band, Carcass. And, um, you know, I could tell he was some interest there, so I was really pitching it to him, sort of like, yeah, we do this, we do that, and um, it seemed that by the end of that session, we'd kind of got some kind of agreement that he was going to do an album with Carcass, so that's what happened. So later on that year we did. Wow. Uh, Where was it recorded? Uh, well, uh, Rich Bench. It was done in December 1987. And who engineered it? Uh, Mike took it? Wrong Ivory. And did that work well? No. Made a complete dog's dinner of it. We've done, I think, in two days. Mm -hmm. We just recorded it live. Um, Sanji wasn't in the band anymore. Literally on the train on the way down, we sat with lyrics, carving them up. You know, who's going to do what? To be honest, I never wanted to do any vocals whatsoever because I'd just been the vocalist in a band. And I hated, believe it or not, I hate the sound of my own voice. And I uh, didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find and, that uh, hard to believe. <laughs> I think. A couple of good recordings have come from Rich Bitch, Sacrilege, Napalm A, Side of Skull. Yeah. Um, I think Heresy's first EP was on there. All that, stuff, all that stuff sounded great, of course. When we go there, the engineer just... He was trying to... I think what he wanted to do was sample the drum kit, like MIDI or something. Yeah, and we were having none yeah. of it. And he just, he just fucking made a mess of it. So we had to go back a couple more times when Bill redid the guitar. Tried mixing it a few times. So basically, we had to make the best of a bad situation and try and salvage it. I mean, you know, it was totally heartbreaking at the time. Um, disappointing, it could have sounded better. Having said that, in retrospect, I fucking love it now. Because it's just so horrible sounding. And it, and it brought a lot of fans to the band that we would otherwise not have yeah, met. Certainly. A lot of people into industrial music or punk or more arty kind of shit, you know? And Peel was playing it to death, so. In all honesty, we weren't really ready. I mean, you can hear that. It's just yeah, listening to the record mm. straight off the bat. I mean, we're not really playing very well. We've got no idea how to produce an album. But um, some people like it for that reason, because it, it's just a mess, really. See, I mean, I, I record it, I remember that we, the actual master tape was a, a Betamax video tape. It was, yeah. That's the only time I've ever seen the studio use that. I think that was like... Early digital back then, but it's the only time, time I've ever seen a Betamax machine in my life. And I'm old enough to remember bloody, you know, you know, crystal bloody waters. <laughs> We incorporated a lot more different styles of bands than what most bands did. Most bands would be influenced by a couple of bands and then they would sound, you know, that, that, that would be the whole range of influences. We took a vast array of influences, maybe yeah. 10, 20 bands. Um, we, you know, we managed to, we never, we weren't the first band to start playing an octave below drop B tuning, but we were the first band that actually made it actually plausible that you could do it and still, you know, stay in tune and have a good guitar sound. I mean, you've got bands nowadays that, you know, use what, you know, seven string guitars. Well, we were doing all that crap back then, just using normal guitars. So, I mean, that's one thing that Carcass will always be, will always take credit for. I mean, we don't deserve it necessarily because bands like Trouble from Chicago were doing that before us, but in our, in our little cesspool, we were the first band that did it. Mm. And we, we did all like the blast beats and the heavy stuff. I don't know, the thing is with a band like Napalm Death, I mean, and no disrespect to that line of back, the early lineup, they, in a way they were kind of one trick pony, they were just doing blast beats. And Carcass was a bit more. Uh, Best time. Yeah, I mean, Ken Starr, the drumming was, he wasn't the most polished drummer, but he was trying to do stuff that most drummers couldn't even attempt to try, you know? It was a bit, we were a bit more kind of progressive in a way. <laughs> Were you in um, Maypalm Death 
so you'd already, your Carcass was already banned when you joined No yeah, Contact. No, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, because I was in both bands at the same time, but I, I mean, Carcass was up and running um, in some form before I joined Napalm. Um, that was, again, part of the tape trading thing in a weird way, because we knew all these people in the Midlands, and, you know, me and Jeff were, you know, we're going down to see... Did you go down to see Napalm? In yeah, films, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were all really into... We just liked Napalm, and then when the guitar position came up, I was like quite keen to do it. So, and then um, you were in. You, you did half of the Scum album. Yeah. And was that as far as you went with Napalm? No, I did that one. Then the next album, an EP, and then okay. yeah, by '89, me and Lee had quit. So why did you decide to quit Napalm and? Oh, loads I mean, of reasons. I mean, um, the the nice reason is that <laughs> <laughs> is that um, I really was much more at home with Carcass, like uh, personally and musically. Like I felt we could do more with the band. There was more scope there, um, and also just you know, like Jeff and Ken were my best friends, so it's like it was easy, an easy decision to make. It was. Um, I mean, Napalm were a, were more successful at that time. Yeah, way more. I mean, Napalm was on TV and the radio the whole time. Um, but, I mean, to be honest, I just couldn't stand to be in the band anymore. <laughs> well, the kids want the horrible. <laughs> oh, God bless them. So what, um, what were you doing differently on, on the first um, Carcass album from what you were doing with um, Napalm? Oh, um... It's weird now from this perspective because obviously, like you know, we're all older and like we like other kinds of music. But in those days, I mean, it was quite a massive difference actually, because um, Napalm was just solidly down the line, fast, fast, fast. Um, at least it was in those days. And um, with Carcass, I mean, we were just like more into having more changes in the music, different tempos, and I mean, it was much more of a metal influence as well. You know, those kind of riffs. Um, it just felt like, yeah, it's really hard to explain, but I felt like each time we did a record, it could be a little bit different. And I guess, you know, the yeah, evidence is that... It's really well there. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah in, in, that, in that world of extreme metal, I guess we... Yeah. I mean, the difference between the first album and, say, the third or fourth record was pretty massive, really. So, um, yeah, I mean, to me, that was the best thing about it. Um, in that genre, I guess, yeah, we, you could see some progress between each record. I think a lot of people see um, a lot of the era, era music as being kind of metal, derived from metal, but um, it, it's actually an amalgam of punk and metal. Yeah, but that's because uh, in the mid-80s a lot of the, the metal bands had grown up listening to American punk, and, and a lot of the punks had grown up listening to metal and vice versa. In the mid-80s it was a real kind of what's referred to as crossover, which is possibly one of the most cringeable, embarrassing terms for music ever invented, but it really was a case of, you know, people in metal bands were starting to admit, or, or trying to pretend they were cool by wearing punk t-shirts. See, just Yeah, and a lot of the punks were basically kids who'd grown up listening to Kiss and what have you anyway, so... Mm. It was a real kind of melting pot, you know? I mean, we, we were a punk band, a metal band, a grindcore band. Pretentious opportunist assholes. I mean, um, it was a fusion of all that kind of stuff, plus, you know, we're pretty, you know, I'd say we were open-minded, we weren't really, we were pretty conservative, because if, if I say what our influences were, they are kind of bookended by certain things, I mean, we're not, I'm not going to sit here and say we're, you know, big fans of bloody, you know, R&B and soul and stuff, because mm. that's bullshit, but uh, it wasn't just straight metal or st straight punk or hardcore, I mean, Ken was listening to a lot of hip hop, and uh, I liked a lot more of the kind of indie stuff. This kind of crap you did on John Peel, so yeah. I liked a bit well, of we'll all listen to John Peel. So I don't know. Um, I think at the end of the day, we have to say, yeah, we were. Of course, we were a metal band, but it, it got called grindcore, didn't it? Yeah. Which, which is a, a, a term I absolutely fucking hated because Mick Harris coined it. I mean, that's not the reason I hated it. I hated any term that used the word core, because that came from hardcore, as in hardcore punk, 
and it was so easy for people to sort of invent these new terms like scar core or whatever core, mum core, granddad core, whatever, you know. So I just thought it was cheesy. So for years I hated it. I mean, as far as I was concerned, we were playing death metal. And that's yeah. a joke. That By the second album, people start to say, oh, they're playing death metal now. Well, hang on. That's what we were always fucking playing. Only now do I actually love the term. Because it's, like, it's just spawned a generation of crazy bands with logos that you can't read. I just love it. The more illegible the logo is, the better, you know. So um, I guess we were playing what was called Grindcore. Did you get on with Mick and the Napalm Boys? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, very good terms with Mick. Um, stayed with mine, blah, blah, blah. See him every other week, so. I mean, like. He wasn't an easy person, and he was very intense, but. I thought we all, we all got him well with him, yeah. Just cracked me up. Um, no, he never glued my shoes to a leather jacket. And that kind of thing, so. I used, to, I used to go down to Birmingham every other week and we'd stay at Jimmy's, the, uh, yeah. one of the bass players who played on the B side of school and he'd always put everyone up and uh, Mick would just be up all night talking and Shane would be there who later joined Napalm and uh, it was great, you know, not got a bad word to say about the guy. Were you guys... Um... Is that a cunt? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's what, what was so cool about it when we first came out. The first album was so bloody noisy that people into kind of bands like Throbbing Gristle or whatever you would like it because it's just complete noise, you know, so... It's a wall of sound, isn't it? Basically? Yeah, I think there's, there's always been a kind of pretentious element to what we were doing, or people conceived that there was. And I think we, I mean, I definitely felt there was when we started. <laughs> What did people think of it? Was it was it well received? Did the media like it? Was it did it cause a lot of controversy? It was well received, but if we're talking about the actual mainstream metal media, they fucking hated it. Mm. Um, but people like someone like John Peel is a bit more arty. He, uh, he loved it. He, I think in the Observed it was his album of the year. Um, so so people, it, it was more of a kind of more highbrow than you know a normal metal release. Like I say, it's kind of pretentious in a way, it was like an arty element to it. It's only like years later that we've been treated a bit better by, you know, the kind of metal scene, if you like. John Peel did quite, he, he championed you guys quite a lot, didn't he? He did. Did you play Peel sessions? Did a couple. And I think that's more to do with the fact he grew up where Ken and Bill came from. And I think he had sympathies because of that, you know. Kind of, nothing wrong with a bit of... Um, Nepotism, if you like. I think he did. He, I think he just thought he was doing a couple of nice lads from Gaming Hairs with a favour by championing what we were doing. And he probably liked the idea because he knows what the area is like. It's pretty middle class. And yeah. He probably thought it was really funny that this fucked up shit was coming from uh, the Wirral Peninsula. You know? He was obviously a big fan of numerous bands in that genre, and uh, he just opened the door for everybody. Who was, who was the first band you gave a session to from that scene? Metro, Metro Hippies, yeah. which is obviously Jeff's old band. Um, th I think the best bit for me was when, it, was it in The Observer? It was his album of the year, the first album, yeah. I think like the idea that the cover's really obnoxious and the music was noise. I think he really got off on that, I think, at first. Because later when we got more musical, I don't, he lost interest, so. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, initially what we were doing really suited him because he, he was, known to, to love music that was confrontational and, and hard to listen to and uh, obviously our first album was definitely in that category um, and yeah when we became more proficient uh, you know it wasn't the kind of thing he was into um, but we were you know we were aware of that but um, yeah all of us lot I mean Carcass, Napalm, everybody was extremely grateful to John Peel because it took a he just took a, a very small scene and made it massive really yeah. Effervescing entrails corroding after years, the stench of the canker brings me no tears. Festering tumours of cancerous decay, northern chewed by maggots with malicious hate. I like to slide my hand inside your stomach and rip out the putrid remains. Drink the pus and munch on the internal organs till all the casket is drained. It's fun being a pathologist, slicing up corpses, especially when they've just been exhumed. I like doing autopsies on festering carcasses. I get high sniffing on all of 